What's going on guys? My name's Matt Omega and welcome back to the show where I play my favorite games in ways designed to make me hate them. Title pending. We return once again to Ratchet and Clank 3 because let's face it, even when this horse dies, I'll never stop beating it. Only this time I come with possibly my stupidest idea to date. Welcome to the Pokedex quest. Okay, second stupidest. The Hollow Shield Glove. A denizen of the weapons menu that's not so much a weapon as it is a defensive tool. What does it do? Why, it throws out holographic shields, of course. Placed correctly, they can keep you decently well protected in some tough situations, but that's really only helpful while you have other weapons at your disposal. And take a while, guess what we don't have. Don't get me wrong, it does have some offensive capabilities, but they're honestly nothing to write home about, and if we're being even more honest, the shield charger outclasses this thing in every way imaginable. Even still, we're left with the burning question of the day. Can we beat Ratchet and Clank 3 with only the Hollow Shield Glove? Rules for the most part are the same as usual. The only weapon we're allowed to use is a Hollow Shield Glove in all of its upgraded forms. Turrets and vehicles are legal when deemed necessary, which by the way, Bio Obliterator does indeed count as necessary. Okay. And the wrench can only be used to turn bolt cranks. Asterisk. Why the asterisk? I'll explain later. Also, for the sake of convenience, I'm allowing the use of long jumping with a thruster pack to break open crates. Now, this run is being done in challenge mode, or new game plus, since the glove can't be bought until after Tyrannosis normally, and good luck pacifisting your way that far into the game. Since we're starting in challenge mode, some extra rules have been added. Ratchet's allowed to begin the run with 100 HP, however, he must start with the base armor. The various armor sets unlocked throughout the game cannot be bought until we reach the point where they're usually unlocked. For example, we can't buy the adamantine iron until we clear Aquatos. Any optional items and gadgets must have not been collected in setting up this file, so that they may be collected at their usual locations. For example, Dax for the charge boots and... we Quark's hideout for the PDA. We're really gonna miss that one, trust me. With all that out of the way, let's get started, as I tell you a tale. The tale of how I tried to beat Ratchet & Clank 3 with, let's be honest, something that isn't even a weapon. And the three attempts it took to get a result. So to really explain my actions for the first few planets, let's quickly dive into how the holo shields work. As I said earlier, the glove throws out a little shield for us that's capable of blocking enemy projectiles. Melee attacks, however, render these things completely useless, and believe me, that part is seriously going to hurt us. I also mentioned earlier that these things do have some offensive capabilities, but we've got to unlock them by leveling this thing up. Luckily, the glove gains experience just by having the shield take damage, so leveling up is actually super easy, barely an inconvenience. That's two challenges in a row I've referenced the same joke. I seriously need some new material. And level it up is what I do. That's right, we're kicking off this run with grinding. Sign of things to come. At level two, the shields gain HP leeching capabilities. So long as Ratchet has less than his max HP, the shields will slowly take health away from nearby enemies and funnel it back into them. And when I say slowly, I mean slowly. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to have an extra method of gaining health back and the extra chip damage can be useful but it just isn't very effective, even if you throw out the maximum number of shields at a time, which is four. Even still, we'll have to keep this in mind as we are going to find ourselves in situations where this will basically be our only option. Level three is going to grant us our primary method of dealing damage, counter shots. When the shields block projectiles, they'll fire back with a jolt of electricity, which will be replaced with these energy bullets at level five, up to two bullets per counter. You might be wondering why I'm air quoting projectiles. Well, remember back in my suck cannon run of the first game, where the game was super inconsistent on what was considered a small enough enemy to be sucked up? Yeah, that, except projectiles. Anyway, now that the shields can counterattack, going through the rest of the normally becomes as easy as usual, and the experience gained from being in challenge mode boosts the glove to level 5 in no time, giving us the ultra shield launcher for the rest of the run. Florana is where it's really got to become apparent just how useless this thing is against melee enemies. But first, we can take advantage of one of Challenge Mode's perks and buy the Mega version of the glove. Along Florana's main path, only one of the three enemy types has a projectile attack that can be counted. The Swamp Monsters. But Matt! I hear you cry. Don't the natives have a projectile attack too? They threw their boomerangs at you. Yeah! They do! They absolutely do! Unfortunately, the game almost completely disagrees. Can the boomerangs be blocked? Yes, but it's finicky. Sometimes I can get it to work, other times it passes right on through. Even if we can block it, for reasons so unbelievably idiotic that I can't even fathom them, it doesn't proc the counter shots, severely limiting how effective we are on this planet. Which obviously means that the best option is to skip it all instead. 
Across from the vendor is a drawbridge leading to the entrance to the Path of Death. Normally it only opens when you reach the entrance the normal way, but there's a wide enough gap around it that we can bypass it from here. Long jump over to these rocks in the water, and then again through the gap to skip basically the entire planet. No time for celebrations yet though, we've still got a boss to fight. Like the natives, Quark is armed with a logic altering boomerang, but we'll rarely use it, opting to chase you around the arena and swipe at you instead. Even with all our health, the lack of armor at this point hinders us immensely, and Quark is able to knock out all of our health in just one strike. So, we got a perfect run this thing. But how, you may be wondering. Counter shots are out of the question, and the HP drain is no good if we just get one shot all the time. But believe it or not, the HP drain is still viable. See all that stuff surrounding the arena? All that lava? Hilariously, it only deals one damage at a time, so you can actually spend some time dropping your health and then let the drain do its thing. Plus, ammo crates constantly respawn around the arena, so you can keep this up forever if you have to. And you will have to. You see, there's just two problems with this. First is that dropping your health takes ages. You're only losing one HP at a time, and you can't constantly bounce in the lava forever. You can only bounce up to three times before you have to return to solid ground, as the full time will just insta-kill you. Also, after making it back to the ground, you gotta wait a sec before jumping back in as your, what I'm calling a bounce counter, takes a few frames after hitting the ground before getting reset. It's likely the game not updating Ratchet as grounded until a certain point in his landing animation, but either way, jumping immediately back in too quickly will just sink you right then and there. The second problem is that this is gonna take an eternity either way. Even if you drop your health all the way down to 1, by the time you've leashed back enough to restore you completely, you've barely dented Quark's health. Is it possible to be him like this? Sure, but your sanity's gonna take a big hit and mine's fragile enough as it is. Fear not, for we have another way. A secret third method by which the shields can deal damage. Just smack him in the face with them. Weirdly enough, the deployment of the shields can actually deal a bit of contact damage. Simply time your throws so that the shield lands directly on top of him and... Voila! Chip damage! Yeah, this is still gonna take a while, but this way is at least a bit quicker, especially if you add in drain damage on top of it. So, we have our damage method, but we've got one more problem. After Quark loses a third of his health, he runs to the edge of the arena and clings to the ceiling while calling out a group of mooks. He'll do this again after two thirds gone, this time with added blood flies, and while you could get through these with some face smackage and a bit of good old fashioned friendly fire, I've got an infinitely better and funnier idea. While Quark is chasing you around, if you lead him around the edge of the arena past the outside of this box, you can actually get him stuck. And this just leads to so many opportunities. From here, you can just keep pelting him with shields while he remains completely helpless. It's not 100% foolproof though. If you move too close to him, you'll enter his attacking range and he'll try swiping at you, which at best will dislodge him and break the box, and at worst, will just kill you. Also, be careful of where you throw the shields. I may have allowed the thruster pack to break them, but the shields are actually capable of doing it themselves. A little too far to the right, and you'll release him from his imaginary prison. Ammo will of course need to be periodically replenished, and running to the other crates to do so will allow Quark to change direction and free himself. Trapping again is easy enough though, so it's not a huge deal. The real great part about this comes when he tries to summon his backup. See, Quark is programmed simply to make a beeline for whatever he's currently targeting, which usually is Ratchet. However, when his health drops by a third, his target switches to his little clinging spot, and his backup won't spawn until he's on the ceiling. When his health drops while he's stuck on this box and his targeting changes, he tries to run directly over there from where he is in a straight line. But from this position, our little box friend is still firmly in his way and nothing about his change in direction has affected his position in a way to release him. In short, if he transitions while stuck on the box, he'll stay stuck on the box. And as long as the box isn't broken, he'll remain there running in place for all eternity. Or until we take advantage of this and lay down some serious face smacking. Ending Florana unlocks the Magna Plate armor normally, so we buy that and off to Marcadia we go. The main level is no biggie, but the range of missions are seriously going to test us. There isn't much extra ammo within the arena, so careful and effective placement of the shields is crucial. Thankfully at this point, my glove had already reached level 8, giving an ever so slightly better edge. Secure the area isn't too difficult as long as you aren't throwing shields around willy nilly, and serves as some decent practice as to what shield formations are effective. Air Assault, however, steps things up big time. The Rangers are constantly around doing what I'm sure is their very best to help, but we could afford to lose them before. In this mission, however, at least one of them must survive to the end. Careful shield placement is only going to get you so far. You're also going to need to analyze and memorize which enemies spawn when and how they move, so feel free to play through and fail a few times to start getting it down. 
Tar Command is a mandatory turret level, so it's free. Under the gun is where things get interesting again. We have to protect the repair rangers fixing the turret, and at least one of them has to survive the full two minutes. The biggest threats are the mechs that are dropped right next to the turret and target the rangers immediately. These need to be taken out immediately, and a well-placed shield right in their line of fire can do just that. In between mechs, you may also want to help thin out the enemy ranks around the arena a bit. The rest will target the ground troops, but they won't last forever, and if they all die, all noids will converge on the repair crew. Level 8 shields thankfully make short work of them with the help of the rangers. Hit and Run sees us running around the arena and turning bolt cranks to bolster the air defenses. The drop ships and the enemies within become less of a threat as the mission carries on, but the beginning can be tricky. Before turning a crank, you'll have to contend with any noids that make it to the ground and hope you clear them out quick enough to give you enough time to lay our wrench to do its only job. Of particular annoyance are the sources which just spawn in whenever the heck they like and the myriad of little one-eyes they drop all over the place. Okay, so we do everything all over again, I do it way faster than the first attempt, go me, and we finish up Marcadia. And now, dear viewers, it's time for things to get worse. It's time for things to get so much worse. Next comes Annihilation Nation, where we're required to do a gauntlet and then an arena challenge. The gauntlet's a piece of cake. The arena challenge... Oh god, the arena challenge. Ten rounds of enemies, four different enemy types, only one of which isn't melee only, only 14 ammo for our glove, and only one round where just three ammo crates spawn. Alright, let's break this down. Round one, gladiators. We can get these guys to attack each other, but the issue is that they take each other out in one hit. Why is this an issue? Because there's going to be one guy left standing, and taking him out takes a lot of our resources. The strategy is to let him knock down our health a bit, smack him in the face with four shields, and let the HP drain do its thing. We take more damage whenever we need, and then we lay down some more shields once the first four run out. I played around this for hours, and unfortunately, the best I could do is take him down with no less than seven shields. That already sets us back by a lot. Round two, a mix of laser bots and bash bots. Laser bots are our friends, as they're the only ones with projectile attacks. I let everything here take each other out again until there's only one laser bot left, and then use a single shield to take it out. Round three, a whole less of the little blade bots. These things are easily taken out by dropping some seals on them, or even relying on the HP drain, but at this point, we really need to limit how much ammo we use. Thankfully, we once again have a better, more comical solution. If you launch yourself into the lava around the arena, right underneath the enemy spawners, you can wedge yourself underneath there, maintaining a very low altitude above the lava for a couple of answers. By doing this, after moving quickly enough away from the blade bots so they start chasing you at full speed, you can lure them down into the lava and take them down that way. Clearing out this round without using any ammo. Just try not to break physics while you're down there. Round four, a mix of laser bots, bash bots, and gladiators. Just like in round two, we want to let everything take each other out and leave one laser bot behind to take you out with just one shield. As you might have guessed, this is the strategy for any round that has at least one laser bot. Round five, another mess of blade bots. See round three. Round six, another mix of laser bots, bash bots, and gladiators. Same strategy as earlier, only this round is the only one in the entire challenge with ammo spawns. Three ammo crates will appear, and you'd better start praying to RNGs is here. Ammo crates will typically drop one ammo pickup by default, and how much this pickup is worth depends on the weapon. For the Hollow Shield Glove, one pickup equals one ammo. Sometimes, however, crates can drop two, and we really want them to do this if we want a chance of getting out of here. After restocking and clearing out the last laser bot, we'll be back up to seven shots at a minimum with a potential maximum of ten. Round seven, a mix of laser bots, blash bots, and blade bots. It's a round with at least one laser bot. Take care of it like the rest. Round eight, blade bots and gladiators. Here is where things get painful. You can have the gladiators take out the little guys and then each other until there's only one left, but at that point, you need to hope you have at least seven shots left to progress, which if the ammo crates gave you the bare minimum earlier, you won't. I did notice something odd here. There were times when one gladiator got hit by another, but didn't instantly die. Whenever this happened, a blade bot managed to get involved in the hit somehow, and the gladiator was left at low enough health that I didn't have to use as many shields. The problem here is that I have no idea whatsoever just how the blade bot was involved. Another few hours I tested with this, and while I was able to replicate it a few times, I still couldn't figure out what was happening or how to reach this outcome reliably. Which, as it turns out, is going to be essential, because... Round 9. Blade bots, bash bots, gladiators, and not a single laser bot in sight. 
So basically we have two consecutive rounds with the exact same problem. And unless I can figure out how these blade bot shenanigans work, we don't have nearly enough ammo to deal with all this. At this point, here's what we need to happen. Get through rounds one through seven normally on a run where all three ammo crates drop two ammo each. Trigger whatever prevents the melee enemies from insta-killing each other to leave one enemy behind with low health on rounds eight and nine. And pray to any god that will listen that after all that, I still have at least one ammo left, as round 10 has a mix of everything, meaning there's at least one laser bot. And to aid in all this, I even set up Ratchet's EXP so that his health would level up to a multiple of 10 somewhere in round 9, which causes Ratchet to somehow manifest a huge nanotech explosion. This didn't help as much as you think. At the end of the day, the chances of all that happening exactly as I need to are... Let's say not the most likely. Thankfully though, I had one more strategy to try, which brings us to... The idea here is simple. Don't go into the arena challenge with a maxed out glove. A neat thing about when a weapon levels up is that it miraculously refills its own ammo completely, which may give us just the edge we need to make it past this challenge. The goal for this attempt was to hold off from buying the mega glove until it got back to nation to ensure that we could make this happen. Some things in the lead up ended up playing out somewhat differently because of this. To gain a better and fresher understanding of everything in the game we've yet to encounter, I set up a whole new file. This time, I didn't buy the glove before I moved into challenge mode. Why? Because now I have a perfectly set up file to tackle a solo run with any other weapon in the game. Wink wink. All I have to do is go through Velden weapon list, which I've detailed in my plasma whip run if you want to go give that a watch too, and buy the weapon fresh on Florana. This means I have to fight Quark with a level 1 glove, but with how we now know to abuse this fight to high heaven, it ain't a problem. Marcadia definitely got more interesting. Last time we had a level 8 glove, which for the most part got us through pretty comfortably. Here, we only have a level 5 glove, and the difference in power between the two is a lot more than you'd think. Missions 1, 3, and 5 still aren't a big issue, but 2 and 4 get a lot more difficult. Air Assault now requires a lot more precision. The first few waves of enemies drop over on this side of the arena, so we want to position ourselves over here and lay down a shield to protect us from the first two sources. Okay, sometimes this guy has a short attention span. Try not to move from this position too much as you lay down another shield to your side to take out the incoming mechs. Lay down another shield where the first one was when the other saucer comes back around. This will protect you from it and the couple of three eyes dropping in behind it. Redeploy your second shield as well, as some more three eyes will drop right behind the mechs. Your first shield may run out again before the three eyes are taken care of, but don't worry, we can afford to lay down another one. Move over in between the ranger's barriers facing the other side of the arena to intercept the next couple of sources. Lay down a shield each to your left and right in time for them to try and flank you. Some three eyes will be dropped from the direction the sources came from, so redeploy that shield and then race over to this ammo crate behind them before the upcoming mechs move into position. Doing this will also make them follow you that way for a bit, so when you run back over behind your shield, they should be around the same spot as the three eyes. Redeploy that shield again, then throw out one to your right to cover the next couple of three eyes to show up. Hopefully by the time these two drop, you'll only have one or two more three eyes standing with not a lot of health left. Their attention should still be on you while the rangers try to get some shots in, so use this opportunity to race around to a few more ammo crates. Next comes the scary part. Two more sources will creep in and a dropship will park right over the rangers' heads before promptly dropping three mechs on top of them. This next part is just as dangerous for us as it is for the rangers, so it's all or nothing here. Throw down one shield facing the palace to block the sources, then drop one shield each in front of each of the three mechs. If laid out well enough, both you and at least one of the rangers should survive the final onslaught. Now, under the gun. It's actually easy as heck. At first I did have a lot of trouble here, but thankfully I managed to find a hidden stash of cheese. Stand on this very spot on the platform and don't ever move. Somehow, this happens to be one of the spots where we can aggro the first mech to target us instead of the repair crew, and in this particular spot, its lasers always catch the lip of the platform, keeping us completely safe. Now, what about everything else? We're not going to be able to jump down and help out the ground troops, so they'll bite it pretty quickly. Luckily, it's still not an issue. Throw a shield down just on the other side of the ranger next to you, then another one directly in front of him. The first will counter the mechs targeting him, the second will protect us from the source that's going to try to sneak its way in. Slimy little scum sack. Our friend here probably isn't going to last too long, but not to worry. Done right, at least the guy to our left will survive to the end just fine. Once mechs start being dropped on our side, lay down a shield to block them, then just keep reapplying the two shields closest to us until time's up. Pretty much everything here wants us dead right now, so we keep attention away from our repair crew, and with this setup, we can just sit back, relax, and ride this- Oh, Jesus! Okay, back to nation. 
Now we finally buy the Mega Glove and grind up a bit of experience so that it levels up right where we need it to. And finally, we tackle the arena challenge yet again, just like we did earlier, with a couple of adjustments. I ended up haphazardly running in with an almost level 7 glove and only just scraped by with the victory, probably because this was my third attempt and I didn't want to be here anymore, can you blame me? What I should have done was gone in with an almost level 8 glove, as level 7 doesn't boost the ammo capacity like level 8 does, and ensured it level up late in, say, round 8 instead of round 7. Also, I should have doubled my efforts to make sure the ammo crates never got broken until I absolutely needed them for a late game boost. But, whatever. At this point, I'll take whatever victories I can get. Now to move on to Aquatos, where things will surely get easier. Things will get easier, right? The Amoeboids here aren't much of an issue. The Hoverbots, on the other hand, well, it depends. If they use their long range shots against you, then they're pretty easily dealt with. If they use their flamethrowers, however, then it's not a fun time, as they can't be blocked or countered. Two hits from their flamethrowers isn't enough to kill us right now. They like to constantly be in close quarters and will slowly chase you if they aren't. Odd thing is, whether they use their guns or flamethrowers isn't up to them being different variants or anything like that. They're the same enemy. And because of this, sometimes their AI is a little... jank. A slightly abusable jank, thankfully, but only slightly. One of the biggest annoyances here is Skid going Galactic Rangers levels of Pansy on us. He's the only one here with a hacker, so he needs to be the one to extend these bridges for us. Thing is, he won't bother while there's hoverbots around, so we gotta take care of them. Now, if only at least one of the hoverbots on every bridge wasn't using a flamethrower. And if only there weren't only one bot on the first bridge, meaning that it's definitely using a flamethrower. And if only there were an easy way to bypass this. Oh wait! There is. So, for whatever reason, after we open the door to the first bridge and backtrack all the way to the vendor and then work our way back to the bridge, Skid will conquer his fears and get the bridge ready anyway. Great! Now we can just run on past and keep up with this momentum easy peasy. Optimism really isn't a good look on me, is it? In the first clog pipe, a combination of HP drain and face smacking can take care of the regular me boys just fine, and some careful placement of shields and baiting of attacks can take care of the king. Just be prepared to constantly jump back down the ladder to shake him off and even backtrack to the vendor for ammo. And seriously, be careful here as one shot from this thing will take you out. And also make note that after you kill a king and collect a sewer crystal, it'll never respawn no matter how many times you die. And die I did. A lot. Unfortunately for us, Skid overcoming his fears was only a one-time thing, so now we have to take out the hoverbots on the next bridge the old-fashioned way. Fortunately, this next bridge isn't too bad, as there are some range bots around to take advantage of when getting rid of the flamethrower bot. Taking out the last range bot can be a little bit tricky though, since it's out of range of our counter shots while we're still on the platform, so we'll need to get right under it instead and try to counter it with some well-placed shields and ample dodging. Then comes the next pipe. If having to face another king wasn't bad enough, this time it's got a flamethrower bot standing guard and it has to be taken out before the king will attack. At least we got an easy way of dealing with the little guys first. Now, remember how I said the AI on these things is kind of jank? Well, trying to abuse that is one of the two options available to us, but it's no less dangerous. The first way to take it out is simply through more face smacking and HP drain. Just remember that the flamethrower isn't blocked in any capacity, so you'll be needing to constantly dodge this thing. The second method... Well, it's kind of weird. The bot essentially has a specific area in which it'll chase after you. Leave that area, and it'll forget you exist. Enter back in, and the chase is back on. The edge of this area seems to be right at the edge of the pipe, and this is where things get jank. By luring the bot to near the edge of its active area, then stepping outside of it, sometimes instead of traveling back down the pipe to its default position, it'll just... sit there. Then while it's in this position, when I walk back into its area, it... swapped weapons? Why does this happen? No idea. Is it consistent? Not really. Can we abuse it? Absolutely. Now that's firing off with this range weapon, we can block and counter its shots with the shields. However, you will still need to stay on your toes, as after getting hit by a counter shot, it can switch back to its flamethrower the moment that its stun animation is over and blindside you. With a bit of patience and a ton of caution, you can eventually take this thing down along with the second and final king. You know, eventually. Roughly the same thing can be done with the bots guarding the final bridge, provided the flamethrower butt doesn't kill both the range ones on the way through. Actually, it was weird to hear. They were moving all over the place and couldn't decide whether they wanted to shoot me to point blank or not. Seriously, the more I play this game, the more I realize the walls are really just made out of duct tape. Either way, we finally nab an armor upgrade and head for Terranosis. First thing we're gonna do here is crash the game. Uh-oh. <laughs>
First thing we're going to do here is learn that these power generators are apparently considered enemies. HP will be drained from them and counter shots target them too. It matters about as much as my other content to the YouTube algorithm, but hey, I like finding new things. Enemy fire will be your friend when taking out the rest of the generators around the island. And for the one up on the tower, you can set down a shield nearby and stand right at the edge to get yourself just in range for a friendly saucer to do the job for you. But I know what you're really interested in. Big Mama. Mama Tyranoid! It's not that difficult. As you may already know, she'll spend most of her time chasing after you and swiping at you when she gets in range. After she's swiped a few times, or hit you once, She'll cling to the ceiling, move some distance away, and then lower the turret on her back to fire. This is where the shields come in. Her machine gun shots are easily blocked, and since she waves it across three times, that's three counter shots being fired off. Even better, if you're positioned just right, the counter shots will fire off twice each, one hitting the turret and one hitting her body. All in all, it's a pretty simple process of run away for a bit, wait for her to stop moving, then quickly move in and throw down a shield. Don't get too cozy though, as it's still a lengthy process, and upon reaching phase two, it ain't getting any quicker. All right, now let's play a game. During phase two, as well as the machine gun shots, Mama will also start firing out missiles. Are these missiles A, projectiles, or B, projectiles? Click on the answer that you think is correct. If you clicked A, congratulations. You just paused the video. Also, you just got your face blown up. No, the answer is B, projectiles. Since despite them acting exactly like projectiles in every way, the game respectfully disagrees. And by respectfully, I, I mean the opposite. There is no respect here. But Matt, I hear you shout from the heavens. What if the shields only block energy-based projectiles like those bullets, but not physical ones like the missiles? What an interesting idea. And because it's so interesting, I'm gonna sit back and let you keep thinking that. I'll even give you a pass on the boomerangs earlier because whatever's going on here doesn't look like it should be, but yeah. Keep thinking that. Anyway, the missiles are gonna stretch out our time here, but before long, we'll get to watch Captain Butchin steal our kill for the millionth time. You know what? I'm not even mad. He paid his dues earlier. Dax continues to make me lose sleep, and for the exact same reason as last time. The warship really is the make or break point for challenges like this. No ammo spawns, a vendor that's just out of reach, and a constantly moving and teleporting target that never touches the ground. As we know from wrench only and whip only, we can shenanigans our way over to the next platform and take it out from behind. That's not going to cut it here though. We need to rely on counter shots here and figure out a way back to the vendor when we inevitably run out of ammo. Luckily, the counter shots actually work here. And against missiles. Hmm. Solving our ammo problem is going to be trickier. The gap back to the vendor is just way too big to long jump across, so we'll need to get creative. But you know, I, I, I just remembered something. That big old asterisk next to the wrench rule. I, I, I wonder what's under here. Aha! An addendum! Stating that... <clears throat> the wrench may also be used to execute advanced movement techniques, provided that doing so does not result in causing damage to an enemy. In short, speedrunning tricks are legal, baby! So how exactly is the wrench gonna help? Well, Clearing Annihilation Nation rewarded us with the Tyra Geist, a gadget originally designed to situationally help us sneak around enemy noids, but its true power is to help us literally reach new heights. By swinging the wrench while the Tyra Geist is active, it'll deactivate and Ratchet will turn back to normal. But if we press jump immediately after pressing square to swing, Tyra Ratchet will jump before the deactivation is complete, transforming back in midair. And then, if we immediately hit square after hitting jump, Ratchet will complete his wrench swing as if he was still on the ground, but in midair. When doing this, there's a very short amount of time where Ratchet will be considered in a grounded state, due to the transformation beginning while he was on the ground. And since we're in a grounded state, we can perform another regular jump. Or, we can perform a high jump to give us even more height than we could reach before. Or, or, we can perform a double jump, effectively making, wait for it, a triple jump. Oh my god. This trick is known as Tira Jumping, which turns Dax into a joke. We can skip the island path to get the charge boots, and climb up to this corner of the facility path to get on the roof and then charge all the way to the final room, and then even have an alternate way to reach the platform behind the warship. All we need to do is set ourselves up facing the vendor, perform our Tira jump and... Oh no... Man, just when I thought I was being clever, I lose my own game. So going into this, I was convinced that the Tira jump would get me back to the vendor, but looking back, I was probably just thinking about the other gap. Well, now that my master plan has gone up in flames, it's time to think of more solutions. 
and promptly fail at all of them. It's a pretty big gap, and none of Ratchet's regular movement options are going to cut it. So I once again look towards speedrunning, and... Well, if you're not a speedrunner, you ain't making it. To use some speedrunning lingo that I'm not going to explain because there's no point, neutral long jumps can get us back over if pulled off just right, but over the course of the battle, the platforms around the arena are going to get destroyed, making the trick so precise that mastering it to the degree of pulling it off at least a dozen times without dying is way too high a bar. And infinite jumps? Don't get me started on why that's not recommended. Benefit of the doubt, with a few dozen tons of practice time on these tricks, sure, it's technically possible, but let me tell you why that doesn't even matter. Scorpio, it seems, is very intent on becoming my arch nemesis. First, he embarrasses me ever so slightly in the wit run, which may have technically been my fault, but good luck getting me to admit that. And now he invalidates this entire run. Two things. One, none of his attacks can be blocked and therefore counted. Two, there are no ammo spawns in this fight whatsoever. Even the warship can technically be done if you're the best Ratchet and Clank 3 player in the world, but this is just straight up impossible. Anticlimactic as it is, Scorpio is the theoretical limit of this run. But since Pain is that toxic X that I just can't help but running back to, let's see how the shields fare for the rest of the game. Right off the bat, not much better. Obani is free, but then Blackwater City throws us into more ranger missions where everything must die and we have very limited resources. The Battle of Blackwater City is accomplished simply with some expert dodging and positioning as we let Friendly Fire take care of everything, but the emphasis on expert can't be understated. We can't take many hits here, and the mechs have far longer range than they have any right. The bridge is no less painful. The mechs on the other side aren't actually any danger, in time the rangers will take them out themselves. The first two as of sources, however, are pretty committed on throwing a spanner into all those works. Luckily, just by walking near them, we can aggro all of them to take attention away from the rangers and take down both waves with one shield each. Alternatively, the rangers can also start targeting them instead of the mechs, so if you want to save the ammo and have an eternity to spare, you can go that route. Next comes a wave of three eyes. Eight of them are spread all around the back of the arena, so holding their attention gets a little harder, as does the shield placement necessary to take them out in as few shots as possible. A couple waves of the little guys roll in, which you can just let the rangers take care of, and then comes the big one. Two mechs park themselves right at the barrier as some more three eyes stroll on in. Bust the expert dodging back out because we're going to need that friendly fire again to take out the three eyes. And we need to stay relatively close to the mechs or else they're going to target the rangers instead. And the mechs on the other side probably aren't dealt with yet. After that, hope you have enough shields left to take out the mechs with counter shots and let the rangers finish off the other ones. Then comes counter attack. Usually, you jump down behind the mechs and take them out, but we need all the ammo we can get, so instead, we can just wait around for the rangers to do the job themselves. I like to think of it as a form of tough love. After that, we have the turrets to deal with. The shield can block them, but there's a better way. Run up to the middle of them and have them take each other out. Okay, sometimes it works. Next comes the waves. There's only two, but that doesn't make this easier. First, four pairs of sources will fly in and start attacking the rangers. For whatever reason, this time they're really committed to taking the rangers out and I couldn't aggro them. So we have to throw down some shields in just the right spots to take them out in as few shields as possible. Then comes the rest. Three eyes on one side, mechs on the other, one eye scattered around, and not a single one of them gives a hoot about Ratchet. Also, they keep moving, making placing shields in places where the counter shot will proc as much as possible immensely difficult. I couldn't actually figure out an effective way to beat this mission. Every time I had a new idea for different shield placements, the constant movement of the enemies just kept proving me wrong. If done just right, it seems like it might be doable, so I'm gonna throw this one down as a maybe. Hollow Star isn't much better. Everything up to the final gauntlet is handled slash run past very easily, but here we once again have problems. Getting to this point involves a pretty big drop, and one that can't be climbed back up. No matter what I did to maximize my height, I couldn't get the Hypershop to hook back onto the Versa targets. So, we have to tackle this with, at most, a regular full tank and whatever ammo we find lying around, which isn't much and isn't enough, as this is one of those gauntlets where everything needs to die in order to move on. The commanders in particular are the biggest issue here due to the sheer amount of shots it takes to take them down. Ultimately, I couldn't clear this one either. And if you're disappointed over how much I wasn't able to clear up to this point, then spoiler warning, but it's not getting old anytime soon. Courtney Gears is next, and if the run didn't die at Scorpio, it was going to here. To even get to her in the first place, we need to go through her backup dances. While not obvious at first, we can get them to damage each other. One of them just needs to be out of their attacking animation. So by getting them to flinch with a face smack, or if they hit you, causing them to back off a touch, they can be killed then and there from another dancer ramming into them. 
But like with the Gladiators in Annihilation Nation, we'll still have one left over that we'll need to rely on the same strats for. Once again, taking a lot of our ammo. Then comes Courtney, who sticks in the dancing cages until she's reduced to half health. The first time she appears, she'll only throw her spinning blades at you, which, shock horror, are projectiles. So we're not doing anything here. If we wait around for long enough, even if we don't do any damage, the flight will move on to the next wave of dancers. If we can get through this wave, Courtney will reappear with her second phase attack set and start using her beam attack, which can be blocked. However, getting there is where we hit our big hiccup. Ammo crates do spawn every now and then, but not nearly enough to get us through this. Even if we could get to Courtney's second phase with ammo to spare, we definitely won't have enough to actually take her down. So yet again, we reach a dead end. Which really sucks because believe it or not, this run's about to get real simple. On Zeldrin's star point, we only need this one trooper to die for the elevator to lower. Otherwise, we can just book it and finally grab the Aegis Mark V armor. We book it through Metropolis as well until we get to our next boss, Giant Clunk. Who's so easy! Firstly, I take advantage of something known as act tuning, which is the game's way of dynamically adjusting the difficulty. When you die, the game decides to throw you a bone by making the current segment easier, usually by decreasing the health of enemies and making their attacks weaker. This applies to boss fights as well, and this stacks. The more you die, the more the game scales the difficulty down. Right after beginning the clunk fight, I throw myself off the side of the train, and then repeat this five more times. I could do this more, but six is plenty, and honestly, it may not have been necessary. Until we drop his health to one quarter, Clunk only has two attacks, Shockwave Bombs and Missiles. The Shockwave Bombs can't be counted, but the Missiles can. Hmm. He'll alternate between the two, so all you need to do is throw down a shield after he's finished throwing bombs, and let the counter shots go to work. Positioning can get a little trickier once he starts flying around and shooting at the same time, but it's easy enough to get a handle of. Also, there's an ammo spawner on the end of the train, and it doesn't run out, so ammo will never be an issue. At half health, a second train comes in giving him more places to fly off to, but you'll still have plenty of opportunity to get some hits in. At less than a quarter health, he adds in his multi shockwave bombs, giving you one more thing to dodge, but it's relatively easy to, and he started sticking to the ground a lot more, making him easy pickings. This was actually a pretty enjoyable fight, and one I had no idea how it was going to turn out which makes it all the more frustrating that the run's already over. On crash site, I once again just booked it, and instead of going through the second half of the level, I backtracked to the top of this elevator and used the charge boost to get me back to the start. I completely skip Iridia because who needs the warp pad when we got our trusty old companion? Weird collision detection! For those who don't know, when Ratchet lands on a really steep slope that would normally slide him off, there's a chance that Ratchet can actually be considered in a granted state for a very brief moment. We can take advantage of this and try to perform extra jumps when this happens, and fortunately for us, it's possible on this pole. It might take a few tries to hit the right spot, but ultimately we can high jump up to it, and then high jump again to reach the ledge. The next warpad obstacle is very easily bypassed with the charge boots, allowing us to access the rest of the level without ever going to Iridia. I then book it through said level. Also, PDA. Let's see, Phoenix Rescue, book it, Poros, double back to the Phoenix to pick up the Infinox armor, then book it, and finally, Command Center. Book it. And now, dear viewers, it's time for the main event. Hollow Shield Glove versus Dr. Nefarious. First phase of Nephi has three attacks, clones, laser guns, and shockwave bombs, and only the laser guns can be counted. First, I dive off the arena a bunch of times to take advantage of act tuning again. I'm not sure what this caps out at, but I died about 20 times just to be sure. I circle around him to dodge his clones, and after the last clone passes, I double back to position myself dead center in his line of sight. I throw down a shield, then move slightly to the side and throw down another one. I do this so that each time he waves his laser guns, they hit both shields, hitting him with two shots at once. Done right, we hit him with six shots every attack cycle. And that's how much damage that is. Strap yourselves in, because this is a ridiculously long one. Ammo thankfully won't be an issue, as ammo spawns around the arena a number of times throughout this phase, and of course, we now have the PDA and a sizable surplus of cash. Keep on him until you take out a quarter of his health, and he does as the rangers do. Take out every enemy along the way to the next arena so that it doesn't get riddled with bullets later on. Not only does it make it more dangerous, but those plus the shields cause the effects to kind of wig out. And effect of this being that the outside bullets become harder to see and therefore dodge. Take your time taking everything out and don't hesitate to restock whenever necessary. Nephi's giant lasers can also be blocked, but there's not a lot of use in doing that. Upon reaching the next arena, the cycle will continue as before, only in between the lasers and bombs, he'll launch two missile volleys that must be dodged. Here, I continue with the earlier strategy. Dodge the clones, throw down my shields, get the damage, then dodge everything else. At half health, he'll launch four mid-air attacks instead of two, and will start firing off his giant lasers as well as his missiles. As he adds more attacks, the fight only gets longer and more dangerous, so caution is of the utmost importance, as just a couple of missteps 
will see us having to start this long, long fight all over again. At one quarter health, he'll add in his most dangerous attack, a multitude of clones that spawn all over the arena. Thankfully, there's an incredibly simple way to avoid it. Simply head over to these large rocks in the very corner of the arena, jump atop the largest, and wait the clones out. Nefri needs to run to the center of the arena to begin this attack, so use that time to get into position. Maybe start heading over as his previous attack reaches its end, provided you can do so without putting yourself in too much danger. Afterward, jump back down, avoid his regular clone attack, and continue the cycle to eventually reduce his health to zero and end this nearly two hour long fight. We trashed the Transformer in no time flat, and I can finally get some rest. So if it wasn't obvious enough already, this run was a frustrating finicky mess that took far longer to finish than I had any right. Never have I had to test this game's mechanics to this extent, which one could argue is a point in its favor. The sheer level of experimentation required just to progress past the first five levels of the game. Man. But imagine my excitement after beating Mama Terranoid just for Dax to pop up around the corner and say no. Thing is, while the solutions to the problems prior were interesting, the process just made me want to pull my hair out. And then we have the second half of the game where that all just goes out the window and the prime strategy is just to run past everything, which no longer makes for an exciting challenge. Clunk was actually one of the few enjoyable parts of this run for me, and you'd think that beating Nefarious with a hollow shield glove of all things would have me jumping for joy, but ultimately all I can manage after was a sigh of relief after the nearly two hour slog that fight was. This run was a stupid idea. It was an incredibly stupid idea, and I knew that from the moment I thought of it. But that's exactly why I wanted to do it. Stupid ideas can be a bit of a wild card and can produce as results or experiences that you may not have expected. Did I expect this run to be a success? No, but did I expect it to reach Dax in the first place? I wasn't really sure. I was already doubting that as soon as Marcadia and the trouble its ranger missions initially gave me, then doubly so with the wall that Annihilation Nation turned out to be. Every single boss became a complete what if, and challenges that would have still been easy with any other weapon became their own beasts requiring their own complex strategies. So was the run frustrating and dumb? Absolutely. But was it also interesting? I think so. Especially since despite everything, the shields ended up being capable of a lot more than what I gave them credit for. Doesn't make me like the weapon anymore, but color me mildly impressed. If only that outweighed how angry this all made me. So yeah. Hard no on the recommend. I basically did this so no one else has to. Shoutouts today actually goes to the lovely people on my Discord server. These guys helped me out quite a bit in the creation of this project, pushing me along, keeping my spirits boosted, and one in particular who even offered me a ton of advice and strategies to use in the run. You know who you are, and I couldn't have done it without you. If you want to stay up to date on my current projects, my Discord is where to do it, so feel free to drop on by. So what did you guys think of the video, and what other challenges would you like to see me do? And to jump back to the title pending joke I made at the beginning, I am seriously thinking of naming this series. My first draft at the moment is Challenge Mode, just to fit with the Ratchet & Clank theme, but if you have your own suggestions, I'd love to hear them. Let me know down in the comments on my open Discord server or on my Twitter at Maticus Omega. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time guys, my name is Matt Omega, and I'll see you guys later.